Eastern, so let's get started. Um, my name is Jamie Rogers. I am um, a member of Open Air. Uh, this is our weekly presentation entitled This is CDR. Uh, we're going to provide you a, a brief background. I'm sure a lot of you are uh, hopefully familiar with what we do, and, um, and uh, if you're not, uh, we'll entice you to, to come back uh, after this week. So um, <clears throat> this is CDR is an online series event presented by Open Air to explore a wide range of, of carbon dioxide removal solutions that are currently being researched, developed, and deployed, uh, and contextualize them uh, in, in the context of uh, policy proposals that we're working on. Uh, and, um, and actually today, uh, we have, I, I think, a, a person uniquely situated to talk about um, policy proposals elsewhere. Um, so uh, we're going to, um, you know, uh, have hopefully a really great dialogue. Please use the chat feature to uh, introduce yourself, uh, post questions. Uh, we will have a Q&A uh, at the end. Um, so again, my name is Jamie Rogers. I'm a, a member of Open Air. Um, we, uh, I'm based in New York. Um, our membership, however, is, is virtual, uh, meaning we're global and uh, we have representation really around, around the world. Uh, we have a high, high concentration in, in New York, and we're going to touch a little bit on some policies we're working on here very briefly. Um, Open Air was founded about two years ago. Um, it's a distributed volunteer network dedicated to the advancement of carbon dioxide removal, or CDR, uh, and solutions to living with the climate crisis. Uh, our global community collaborates on an open source model. Um, so we collaborate on research and development, policy and advocacy, uh, and uh, the CDR uh, marketplace development. Uh, we'll put links to the website and our Twitter handle in the chat. Uh, please follow us. We'd love to have you join. Um, <clears throat> so uh, most of you are probably familiar with CDR, otherwise, you know, you wouldn't have stumbled into our, uh, our series. Uh, but it is the practice of capturing CO2 from the atmosphere and storing it safely and durably over a long period of time in the geosphere, the ocean, or long-lived products, um, you know, such as construction materials. Uh, when considering CDR, as we are today in the series, it's essential to say that CDR is not in any way an alternative, um, alternative to reducing emissions. Um, however, it is a necessity to reduce global, uh, global greenhouse gas uh, both, both, uh, both the current presence of those greenhouse gases uh, and future emissions that are hard to abate, hard to get rid of um, in our modern, modern economy. Um, however, uh, just to emphasize again, we must decarbonize the economy and open air, um, you know, firmly believes that CDR is not a replacement for that, that philosophy. Um, there are, uh, in the recent IPCC assessment, um, there's actually a, a lot of evidence and science around uh, the fact that CDR is necessary at the gigaton scale, that's billions of tons, uh, to extract uh, CO2 from the atmosphere by mid-century to uh, counteract the most sort of uh, horrific and um, catastrophic consequences of, uh, of our current trajectory of anthropogenic um, CO2 emissions. So, you know, whether, uh, you know, wh where you stand on the spectrum of, of how, um, how much we should decarbonize the economy and how fast, uh, we all think that should be fairly immediate, but it is also necessary today to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, so if you're new to CDR uh, and um, uh, if you have, um, you know, any uh, uh, sort of, you um, you know, uh, interest in getting more involved. Um, I, I do want to briefly touch on, uh, you know, some of the work we're doing. Again, we, we focus on R&D, policy and advocacy, and marketplace development. Uh, one, one piece of legislation we have is um, the Carbon Dioxide Removal Leadership Act, which we now have both uh, uh, New York State Assembly and State Senate sponsorship for. Um, it is essentially a state uh, procurement policy for CDR. So the idea is the state would create a market to support um, scaled 
durable CDR. It would have uh, you know uniform standards, uh, which would help drive the industry into a um, you know a more standardized place. It's centered on equity, and environmental justice, um, meaning it incentivizes you know CDR uh, both from a business development standpoint as well as from an environmental standpoint. Uh, you know, cleaning up the air and communities that need that most and have suffered the most. Um, so we we are piloting. CDR LA in New York. We'd love to have your support. We're now at the phase where we're you know, trying to drum up all, all the elected official co-sponsors we can. Uh, and we're also working on the same initiatives in a variety of other states. Uh, we have missions in California, Washington, Arizona, Colorado, Massachusetts. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Illinois today, hopefully. Uh, and, um, you know, we'd love to have you join. And obviously, if you have other ideas, we'd love to hear those as well. Um, so right now we're going to uh, kick this off um, and get started with our conversation with Dr. Will Burns. I'm going to hand, hand it over to my colleague, Mega, uh, and she's going to take it from here. Thanks, Jamie. Um, hey, guys, I'm Mega. I am an open air member based out in London, uh, but working on policy opportunities out in California, where I'm from. Um, quick housekeeping note. So our format will be a 15 to 20 minute presentation followed by a few prepared questions, and then we'll have moderated audience Q&A. So please do type any questions you might have into Zoom's Q&A box. Um, note that that's separate from the chat function, so please find the one that says Q&A, and we will try to get to them towards the end. Um, the event is being recorded. Uh, we'll send the video out to everyone who registered. We'll also post it to Opener's website and to our YouTube channel, um, and we will also be live tweeting today's event. So we'll put the Twitter link in the chat, and please follow along with that. Um, if you do tweet, the event hashtag is hashtag this is CDR. Um, so now for the main event. This week on This is CDR, we're very pleased to welcome Will Burns, who is one of the world's leading experts on carbon removal, carbon removal governance, um, as well as law and policy to teach us about the numerous legal and regulatory issues that must be addressed as we look to demonstrate, deploy, and scale new CDR pathways. Dr. Will Burns is a visiting professor in the Environmental Policy and Culture Program at Northwestern and also teaches in the Masters of Science and Energy Sustainability Program in the Department of Engineering. Prior to this, he served as a founding co-director of the Institute for Carbon Removal Law and Policy at American University's School of International Service in Washington, DC. He also served as the president of the Association for Environmental Studies and Sciences, as well as a senior research fellow for the Center for International Governance Innovation. Uh, Will, over to you. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Mega, for the introduction. And thanks to uh, Open Air for uh, inviting me. I uh, love the work you do, and uh, I look forward to uh, interacting with, uh, with the audience. So let me uh, share my screen here. So. Uh, let me say one thing at the outset when we think about uh, uh, law and governance of, of carbon removal, which is in its nascent field. One thing that's clear is that uh, there isn't a one size uh, fits all sort of approach in this context. Uh, one of the things uh, that I want to emphasize at the outset is depending on the kind of carbon removal you're talking about and where you might be deploying that uh, approach uh, will uh, strongly affect what uh, regulatory uh, regimes and institutions uh, that, uh, that that you'll encounter, both in terms of research and uh, potential uh, deployment of these approaches. And uh, in the last couple of years, uh, Romney Webb, who's a researcher at uh, Columbia University, has done uh, some excellent work talking about uh, domestic, uh, it mostly focused on the United States, domestic regulation of uh, carbon removal, including in the context of uh, enhanced mineral weathering. And uh, when it comes to uh, uh, these kind of approaches, that's, uh, that's the level, the national level and the state level, and to some degree, the local level, where a lot of the, uh, the, the, the regulatory and governance uh, uh, will, will take place, right? Things like the National Environmental Policy Act uh, uh, and uh, land use regulations, uh, regulations related to the uses of waste and, and so forth. Uh, but what I wanted to emphasize today was some of the international uh, governance aspects of some of these approaches. And these are approaches that may be deployed either in the global commons uh, and uh, a lot of uh, the ocean-based approaches uh, for carbon removal, everything from uh, the electrochemical through ocean alkalization enhancement or ocean iron fertilization, uh, ocean upwelling and downwelling uh, would fit into this category, as well 
as uh, approaches uh, that uh, might take place uh, in uh, uh, domestically, but have uh, cross-boundary implications. A lot of these uh, might be uh, regulated at the international level. And I just wanna talk about what some of those institutions are and what the implications may be in terms of uh, uh, the future of, of carbon removal research and, and deployment. So one thing I'd say at the outset is that in the last decade, there's been two international treaty institutions or regimes uh, that have addressed carbon removal. And this was in response to ocean iron fertilization experiments. As you know, there's been 13 of those to date and, uh, and uh, institutions began to take note of these efforts to seed uh, uh, test areas with, uh, with ferrous sulfate. So the first of these is a, a convention that its shorthand is called the, the London Convention. And the London Convention was established in the 1970s uh, to regulate the dumping of waste into the world's oceans as uh, uh, the threats of, uh, of waste uh, disposal uh, terrestrially began to grow during this time. Uh, many countries began to dump more of their waste into the oceans, and there was uh, general alarm about the potential implications of it. And so this convention was created in the 70s to uh, regulate uh, dumping of wastes into the oceans. So this regime uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, two th in uh, 2008, uh, passed a resolution uh, on ocean iron fertilization. And it was kind of a, a, a good news, uh, bad news uh, story in some ways for those uh, that were engaged in ocean iron fertilization research. Uh, the good news is, is that the regime held that uh, this didn't constitute dumping because there is an exception in the treaty that says that if you're putting materials into the ocean for a purpose other than quote unquote mere placement, and in this case, they weren't, you know, putting the iron in the ocean just to uh, dispose of it, but to try to effectuate fertilization, um, then uh, it didn't constitute dumping. However, uh, you, this exception could only be invoked if uh, what you were doing was not contrary to the purpose of the treaty. And so to the extent that the purpose of the treaty was to ensure uh, that uh, there were no negative impacts, uh, they established some conditions, right? And, and these are the conditions that were established under the resolution. First of all, they held that ocean iron fertilization uh, uh, could only uh, be effectuated in the oceans for quote unquote legitimate scientific research. So you couldn't be seeking to do it to sell uh, carbon credits, for example, in the voluntary uh, carbon market or, or under the Kyoto Protocol. Second of all, uh, it required uh, that there be a, uh, an assessment framework that would be established to do a case-by-case -case assessment of the risks and uh, potential benefits of, of utilizing this approach. Uh, and then in uh, 2010, uh, they established this assessment framework. And any of you that have risk, or worked in the area of risk characterization can see this is a, a, a standard sort of approach. So uh, the effort was made to try to ameliorate any potential negative impacts associated with this research uh, and to uh, ensure uh, ongoing monitoring in terms, of, uh, in terms of the results. Now, this approach had, uh, has several limitations. Uh, one thing that should be emphasized is that the resolutions that the parties to the convention pass aren't legally binding on the parties, okay? Most of the time, the parties adhere to these resolutions, uh, but they are uh, recommendations. Uh, second of all, uh, obviously, uh, this approach uh, it was, was very limited. It was uh, limited to uh, ocean iron fertilization, and obviously, it would not apply to any approach that didn't involve uh, placement of materials in the oceans, right? It's not going to be pertinent for regulating things such as backs or direct air capture uh, and, and, and so forth. Um, and, uh, and, and those were, those were limits uh, that, uh, that, that still exist. Um, now, it's contemplated that the London Convention will eventually be replaced by a, a, a more modern uh, treaty to address ocean dumping called the London Protocol. Uh, and uh, the, the London Protocol has uh, uh, many fewer uh, parties to it uh, than the convention does. Uh, but in, 
it's subsequently adopted an amendment uh, to uh, the protocol to specifically address uh, ocean iron fertilization and other uh, marine geoengineering activities, right? And so this amendment has several uh, elements. First of all, uh, it expanded uh, the potential uh, purview of regulation to all marine geoengineering activities, and that was defined in a way that would encompass virtually any of the ocean-based uh, CDR approaches that we're, we're thinking about, as well as solar radiation management approaches. Um, it required uh, that parties uh, to the treaty uh, issue permits to their nationals that might want to engage uh, in this kind of activity. Uh, and again, limited this, uh, at least initially, to scientific research and, uh, and projects that had no uh, uh, motivation for commercial gain. And then established an assessment framework that looked a lot like uh, uh, the previous one that we talked about. Uh, this uh, approach uh, also has some, uh, some limits. Uh, again, uh, we're talking about activities that involve placement of materials in the ocean, so it doesn't apply uh, to uh, the terrestrial approaches that we talk about. Um, second of all, um, even though an amendment to the treaty is now legally binding, as opposed to these resolutions that we're talking about, it requires a sufficient number of parties to uh, uh, ratify that amendment before it becomes legally binding. And uh, so far, you've had only a handful of, of countries that have uh, ratified it. Uh, you, you need approximately another uh, 30 uh, to, uh, to actually have it come into force. So at this point, uh, it's more uh, a set of, uh, of guidelines than, and than anything else. And then the third limitation is that uh, at least one key country that might engage, uh, whose nationals might engage in uh, this kind of activity in the future uh, is not a party to the London Protocol, and, and that's the United States, though we are a party to the, uh, uh, the convention itself. The second uh, treaty regime that uh, responded to ocean iron fertilization experiments was the Convention on Biological Diversity. And the CBD uh, was established in the 1990s to try to address the alarming decline in biodiversity. And so uh, the parties were concerned about uh, the potential impacts of ocean iron fertilization uh, for uh, ocean uh, biodiversity. So they passed a resolution also in 2008 uh, and uh, they called on uh, 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 compiling scientific uh, research on, uh, on these activities, okay? And then in uh, 2010, uh, they uh, also uh, passed a resolution uh, that was broader in some ways than the resolution passed by the London Convention. As you can see, it says there should be no climate-related geoengineering activities that may affect biodiversity uh, uh, absent uh, meeting these conditions, right? And that's, uh, again, small-scale scientific research, uh, no commercial motive, and uh, a thorough prior uh, uh, assessment of the impacts, right? And uh, they subsequently defined uh, geoengineering uh, to, uh, to be very broad, right? It encompasses any solar radiation management approach or also any carbon removal approach on a large scale uh, that may affect biodiversity. And so in this case, uh, the, the CBD resolution could uh, potentially uh, uh, be pertinent for some terrestrial approaches if they were done on a large scale and potentially could have uh, biodiversity impacts. For example, large scale afforestation and reforestation or large scale backs uh, could uh, potentially uh, be regulated under the CBD. Uh, there are limits to uh, the CBD uh, also in this context, however. First of all, the resolutions, again, that they pass are not legally binding on the parties. Uh, the uh, focus of the regime is on biodiversity impacts, so it doesn't uh, discuss a lot of the other impacts that we might think about that are pertinent in terms of CDR uh, that, uh, uh, that we might want to look at. Now, how about the future? Uh, it, what other uh, 
uh, international regimes might be uh, pertinent when it comes to uh, carbon removal. Well, the most logical one is the Paris Agreement, right? To the extent that carbon removal seeks to be a way to respond to climate change, and it's contemplated by many uh, that it might be the third leg of the stool, right? The one being the traditional uh, uh, mitigation methods, the second being adaptation, and the third being carbon removal. Uh, it seems uh, logical to, to ask whether the Paris Agreement might uh, uh, regulate uh, uh, the deployment of carbon removal approaches in the future and how. Uh, and so um, the first question I think that's pertinent is, uh, could the parties to the Paris Agreement include carbon removal as part of their NDCs, their nationally determined contributions, or the pledges that they make uh, to, uh, to address uh, climate change, okay? So uh, we start with Article 4, and it says each party will maintain successive NDCs, and, these, uh, and to meet these NDCs, they're to pursue, quote-unquote, domestic mitigation measures, right? So the first question you would ask is, would carbon removal constitute a domestic mitigation measure? Well, despite the fact that mitigation, the term mitigation is used 18 times in the Paris Agreement, it's never defined, right? Uh, the Paris Agreement is, uh, uh, is tied to its parent agreement, which is the Framework Convention. And the Framework Convention does uh, uh, help us define that term. So in Article 4 of the Framework Convention, it says that mitigation is either limiting anthropogenic emissions of greenhouse gases, so uh, reducing emissions, or protecting and enhancing greenhouse gas sinks and reservoirs, right? And so most people agree uh, that uh, the, uh, any effort to enhance sinks through carbon removal would constitute a, a, a mitigation measure. And, as, and to that extent, uh, the parties could, uh, consistent with Paris, include uh, carbon removal within their NDCs. And indeed, uh, uh, many of the parties already include afforestation and reforestation within their NDCs, though it's usually not denominated as, as carbon dioxide removal, but it seems to provide a good uh, 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 ramp into that. Um, another uh, way uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, the Paris Agreement could potentially bring in carbon removal is in Article 6. Article 6 provides for so-called market-based mechanisms uh, to help uh, uh, effectuate one's uh, meeting of their NDCs. So uh, these were part of the Kyoto Protocol, the, though in more detail, Paris has brought this in. And the idea is, is that countries can cooperate to uh, potentially site projects in other countries, uh, pay for those projects, and then um, uh, claim credit uh, that can be applied toward their NDCs for uh, reductions in uh, emissions or removal of, of uh, carbon from the atmosphere uh, that occurs, right? And Article 6, 2, and 4 uh, both provide uh, mechanisms to do this. Um, at the last uh, uh, conference to the parties at Glasgow, uh, the parties uh, started uh, putting uh, meat to, on the bones of the so-called Paris rule book in this context. Uh, and that provides the more specific guidelines of how one would engage in this kind of, of, of trading. Right, and so it's possible in the future uh, that some of the carbon removal uh, projects that we have uh, related, for example, to uh, bioenergy and carbon capture or direct air capture uh, might occur in this context with certain countries helping to finance uh, uh, carbon removal programs in other countries where there might be more pro propitious conditions for storage, for example, or, 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 or access to, uh, to bioenergy. Uh, and then uh, uh, credit that toward uh, their commitments. Um, Article 6, uh, six uh, also uh, provides for non-market-based mechanisms, things like financial transfers. And so it might uh, uh, provide for uh, uh, certain countries to help other countries in developing uh, carbon removal uh, uh, technologies and approaches uh, in, in the future. Um, and then finally, uh, irrespective of whether the parties uh, actually uh, decided to use carbon removal as part of their NDCs, there's other language in Paris that could provide guidance in terms of the scope of deployment of these approaches and 
uh, and uh, and risk uh, as assessments, right? So the preamble to Paris says that uh, we recognize that parties may be affected not only by climate change, but the impacts of measures taken in response to it, right? And so uh, if there were carbon removal approaches that at very large scales, for example, that could have potentially negative impacts uh, uh, that could potentially be assessed by the parties uh, under under Paris. Uh, and uh, there's other language here uh, that talks about uh, uh, considering obligations in terms of human rights. And so, for example, if you were to deploy uh, bioenergy with carbon capture at a very large scale and you potentially diverted uh, lots of agricultural land and it resulted in substantial increases in food prices uh, that denied access to food in certain parts of the world, uh, that could be a, a, a violation of the human right to food, right? And so a, a human rights-based uh, uh, risk assessment uh, could potentially be called for under the Paris Agreement uh, in the future as these approaches are, are developed more. Article two talks about uh, looking at uh, 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 global responses to climate change in the context of sustainable development. Again, this could cut either way, right? Uh, uh, arguably carbon removal approaches could further uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, they could also, it, in some cases, especially at very large scales, potentially undermine them. And this provides a hook for the parties to uh, consider those uh, things uh, in, in the future. Um, and then finally, I'd say there are other potential uh, international regimes that might be pertinent to uh, carbon removal in the future. One is the Law of the Sea Convention. Again, for any approach uh, that would be ocean-based, it provides for uh, 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 um, a framework for marine research, uh, but it also provides for potential liability uh, for harms that might occur as a result of that research. The same thing in terms of deployment. Um, there's a new treaty being created under the uh, Law of the Sea Convention called Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction. And uh, the party, uh, the negotiators for that have uh, expressly included marine geoengineering as, uh, as one of the topics that they're discussing. And so the development of marine protected areas uh, 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 and the development of uh, uh, transboundary environmental impact assessment uh, and the need to notify other potentially affected parties uh, might all have relevance in terms of, uh, of any kind of marine-based approach uh, in the future. Uh, human rights conventions, as we've talked about, could be pertinent uh, uh, to uh, carbon removal. Uh, and then there's customary international law principles, uh, such as the precautionary principle uh, and the no harm rule, which uh, provides an obligation not to uh, create harm uh, for activities that are within uh, one's controller jurisdiction. And uh, uh, that could again require notification of other countries if there's approaches that potentially have impact either across boundaries uh, or uh, in, the, uh, in the global commons. Um, and so I'm gonna stop there and, uh, and say that many of, uh, may, obviously a couple of these uh, uh, international institutions have already acknowledged uh, carbon removal, uh, they're likely uh, to expand that purview uh, in the future. Uh, for example, the uh, London Convention has now established a correspondence group uh, to talk about other uh, marine uh, geoengineering approaches. Um, and one of the things that I'd caution is that there's, there's a lot of rhetoric out there that says that, well, what the London Convention is trying to do is simply shut down uh, this kind of uh, approach. And so uh, you have some startups, for example, that simply don't want to engage uh, with conventions of this nature because of that. Um, one of the things that's clear from discussions with uh, those that are on these groups is that there is a recognition uh, that carbon removal may have to play a role in addressing climate change. Uh, uh, and th there's an understanding of that. And I think this correspondence group effort is more to uh, ex expand the purview of, of approaches that might be looked at uh, and try to ensure uh, that, uh, that in the future we do research and potential deployment responsibly. But I don't think it's necessarily an effort to, uh, uh, to try to impose a moratorium or shut this down. And I think this is true 
uh, with most of these uh, international institutions. And regardless, uh, if one ultimately starts engaging in these activities uh, in the open ocean uh, or uh, in the case of Paris, uh, in almost every context, uh, it's going to be important to engage and probably engaging early uh, to uh, uh, talk about how uh, uh, regulation might occur is going to be important uh, if we're going to keep uh, carbon removal research and, and potential use in the future uh, on track in any kind of realistic uh, timeline. And so I will uh, stop there. Terrific. Thank you, Dr. Burns. I really appreciate uh, this overview. It's very, very, very helpful. Um, and uh, and I think you know, you, uh, somewhat unique to what we've covered uh, on uh, this is CDR. It's uh, a, you know a much larger scope, and especially in covering the international um, context around which uh, you know people are trying to you know puzzle out how to uh, what CDR actually counts for and and what and how it can be achieved. Um, so we're uh, going to turn now to some questions. Um, I, I, we have a, a, a couple uh, from the open air side, and then I think we'll uh, get into um, some questions that are coming in through the chat. Um, <clears throat> so one uh, question in particular uh, that I think um, a lot of folks want to understand um, is where are, well, actually, let, let, let me start with more of a biographical one. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you got into this field in particular? Um, you know, you, you mentioned you know your uh, you know other colleagues um, that you work with, like Romani. Um, but I'm curious to know sort of what what sparked your interest in you know and, and what's driven you to um, make this kind of your your scholarly pursuit. Yeah, yeah, I got into it accidentally. Uh, so I was. Uh, I was going to be a, a visiting scholar uh, at uh, Williams University uh, in, the, in the last decade. And I was uh, flying there and discovered that I needed one more, one more week of, uh, of, of topics uh, for an international environmental law class I was teaching and I didn't have one. And I was waiting to get off the plane and the gentleman next to me had dropped his USA Today newspaper on the seat. I picked it up and there was a discussion of this new idea called climate geoengineering. And I was already a climate guy, but you know, had a real shirt tail acquaintance with what geoengineering was. And I read the article and I thought, well, this is cool. It's, uh, you know, it's science, it's technology, it's law, it's ethics. Uh, you know, I think by the week 17, I can have something uh, ready to do on this. And, uh, and so I did. And then, you know, as is often the case, right, uh, things aren't planned. I got very interested. And then I went to Washington to run a program at Hopkins, and uh, I got a, a contacted by the CIA, uh, who was funding the first uh, uh, National Academy of Science study on solar radiation management, and uh, started talking to me about this. And I thought, wow, this, this may be actually a thing. Uh, and so, uh, I, I started a, a, a research center with a colleague of mine at Americans, and then uh, I ultimately started working on, on a carbon removal uh, after that, uh, and uh, I've been doing it ever since. Great. Um, well, that uh, and and we're glad you have um, because your you know your scholarship and the the things that you have driven in terms of you know infra scholarly infrastructure around this. Area. I think are really important. Um, wanted to know, sort of related to that, uh, you know, how, how did kind of um, the 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 attitudes or the motivations of, of your students come into play in, in in the work you do and the the, the scholarship you're you're pursuing? I you know I, I asked the question only because I you know climate change awareness um, you know cognizance is is a, you know is very generational, right? And I think you know younger younger folks in the legal field. Um, are probably you know, more acutely aware of the concern around uh, climate change and what we need to do, um, you know, to to mitigate uh, and adapt. So, uh, just curious if you know, it's sort of how 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 the student um, component comes into play. Yeah, yeah, it's it's important in a lot of contexts. Uh, one is a uh, a lot of the 
uh, stuff that I do publicly in terms of lecturing, um, I do some of that in my classes. And so they're an excellent test bed, right? They'll tell me when something isn't clear or when something just makes no sense, right? And so <laughs> helps me uh, helps me sharpen those kind of things up. Uh, second of all, you know, you really nailed it in terms of the intergenerational. It it helps remind me that even though you know uh, an older guy like me is going to is going to face some of the impacts of climate change, right? Ultimately, the most serious impacts, right, are 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 going to manifest themselves during their uh, uh, their thirties and forties and fifties. And so, uh, I I often I often take to heart uh, their concerns about. Uh, addressing climate change in my generation, where we have some potential ability to still ameliorate some of those impacts and 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 to keep focused on that. And carbon removal, you know, I think is one of the ways that this generation can help to try to uh, redress, as it were, uh, some of the mistakes that my generation and my parents' generation made in in not trying to address uh, climate change earlier and more aggressively. Great. Well, and yeah, and, and uh, we do see that in open air, um, a tremendous amount of enthusiasm from from students, you know, uh, you know particularly undergraduates and even high, if, uh, folks in high school. So, you know, the um, uh, it, 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 it goes without saying that it's uh, at the forefront of, uh, of that generation's mind. Um, I'll ask one more question and then I, uh, we have a bunch of um, uh, really interesting questions to go to in the chat. So, uh, you know, wh where have you seen sort of the biggest evolution in CDR law and policy in, in your time, um, you know, in, in the field, uh, you know, and, and from, from where is that coming, either, you know, jurisdictionally or from a particular, you know, type of CDR or, or you know, type of kind of end goal from a policy standpoint, you know, um, how has the, how's the map kind of changed, um, you know, from your standpoint? Yeah. Well, I think it's changed radically in the last couple of years. I mean, when I when I was working on this, you know, 10 years ago, uh, I think legitimately for a lot of people in in the in the law and policy realm, it was is is purely notional, right? Uh, I mean, there was there was CCS happening, right? But not much CDR and and not much need, I think. For uh, for them to focus on it, right, and and that's radically changed, right, and uh, uh, I think in the United States, for example, uh, uh, the the Biden administration's uh, uh, massive funding now, massive compared to the past, uh, for for carbon removal, uh, the the the, uh, uh, the 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 Earthshot initiative, right, which essentially calls on all of the agencies that might be pertinent to this. Uh, to 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 take uh, to pay attention to carbon removal has made a real difference. When when I talk to people in EPA now, for example, about specific startup companies and 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 how they might approach them, uh, there's more expertise uh, in the agency, more understanding of of what this is, and there's more amenability uh, to engage uh, with uh, with those kind of actors because there's a recognition. Uh, that the Earthshot means that uh, there, that it's all hands on deck, right? To uh, to at least try to facilitate some of this research and separate out what might be viable from what is not, right? And so that's that's very different. And I think at the international level, uh, you're seeing again increasing recognition uh, in the last couple of years that uh, that carbon removal is likely to be part of the equation, right? This the biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction treaty that's being designed, right? Expressly uh, talking about uh, uh, these issues. Uh, a lot more discussion at Paris in the last couple of years at the Conference of the Parties about carbon removal, um, a much more focused approach on the part of the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, and we'll see more of it in the in the third report in terms of how we respond to climate change, including some discussions of, of, of legal issues, right, in a far more granular sort of way. So I've, I've seen a lot, of, a lot of development. That doesn't mean there's not a long way to go, but I think as we start seeing more and more uh, startup companies uh, moving to the, to the field research phases, uh, that we're gonna start operationalizing some of the laws, 
and we're going to start seeing where we have gaps uh, and and how we fill those uh, uh, very soon. Great. Well, as a as an attorney, I'm excited uh, excited to work on those uh, those problems and challenges and help fill those gaps. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Mega, uh, who has been um, kind of uh, moderating the, the questions or collecting them. And uh, Megan, I don't know if you, you want to take the wheel and um, maybe call out some of the questions. Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, we have a bunch of good questions. Um, one of the first ones, which I think is uh, quite important, is um, you mentioned a lot of these agreements that are not legally binding. So do you think they're still going to have an impact? Or what do you think is kind of the best pathway forward into making them more impactful? Yeah. So if I, if I didn't make this clear, the actual treaties themselves are legally binding, right? But the resolutions that they pass at, at their meetings um, are not usually legally binding unless they specify in the treaty that they're supposed to be, right? So they're, they're recommendations, right? But one of the things that we see for the most part when it comes to uh, recommendations that are made at, at these meetings is that the parties generally do follow them, right? As, as, a, as a law person, it's obligatory for me to say they're not legally binding, right? Just to remind <laughs> everybody. But from a practical standpoint, um, they, they have a lot of moral suasion, right? So uh, I, think, I, I think that's helpful. Um, you know, the, the, London, the London Convention, right, which has kind of been the leader of, of looking at, uh, at these approaches, uh, of course, in the, in the protocol, right is amended the treaty itself right and so that that becomes legally binding right so um i think that uh is what will happen in in paris eventually for example is they have this paris rule book which uh, you know is the rules of the road for uh, for how you implement paris my guess is that there's there's lots of provisions already that would be pertinent to carbon removal including some of those article six those trading mechanisms but my guess is, is that as uh, we start to really look in earnest at using carbon removal as one of our ways to respond to climate change, they'll develop more uh, specific uh, uh, provisions in, in that context uh, also. And uh, this correspondence group in the London Convention will probably help with that too. Uh, but I think even though they're, uh, most of these are voluntary, uh, uh, the, parties, the parties are going to uh, adhere to them. In fact, when uh, when we've been talking about ocean iron fertilization experiments uh, in the next couple of years, for example, um, almost in every case, the researchers uh, reference what, what London has been calling for. And uh, a lot of startup companies I know, including some that have been looking at, uh, you know, kelp farming in the open oceans, for example, um, have started talking about how they're going to engage uh, with, these, with these treaties in a way that's, uh, you know, responsible and helpful. Right. Okay. Makes sense. And yeah, talking about the London Protocol, um, you mentioned the U.S. is not a signatory to that. Um, why do you think that is? And is there any potential of us signing on in the future? Yeah. So we're a signatory, but we haven't ratified it, right? And the okay. distinction is, is that uh, we have some general obligations not to mess it up with its intent, but we don't have to adhere to the specific uh, obligations of it. Uh, I, I, we haven't joined the protocol, I think, because uh, a lot of its requirements in terms of marine pollution are pretty stringent, and I think there's been a lot of pressure from the domestic shipping industry, uh, especially in terms of uh, oil pollution, uh, to, uh, to not uh, uh, become a party. Uh, I would be surprised in this environment uh, if we became a party to the protocol anytime soon. You'd, you'd have to send it to the Senate for ratification and you need two thirds of the Senate, right? And you know, the way, the way our Senate is constituted at this point, uh, I think if you, if you tried to, to, to pass a resolution that said that puppies were cute, it would be hard <laughs> to get two thirds of them, right? Much less uh, a, an international treaty, right? right. So probably not. Um, we, you know, we have what's called observers at, at these kind of agreements, right? Who, who provide input to the process. And we often, for example, uh, adhere to treaty uh, obligations uh, even when we're not a party to the treaty, like the Law of the Sea Convention, for example, that I talked about at the end. We're not a party to the Law of the Sea Convention because we didn't agree with the provisions to share proceeds from mineral mining, right? Uh, but we 
acknowledge that most of the provisions are are what we deem to be international law and and we adhere to them right so there's a lot of informal uh, uh adherence to uh to law uh even when one isn't formally a party to it and and that might might turn out to be the case uh uh here also Right. Okay. Um, we have a lot of questions about ocean-based CDR in the USA. So um, one person asked, you know, where would you start? So just starting the process of like permitting and kind of getting that started. Is it the EPA who should be starting that? Um, some other organizations? Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah, how does that yeah. So, so there's been a lot of discussion of that uh, recently. And, and I've had some discussion with, with folks in the U.S. government because I've been on advisory boards of, of startups that are looking at ocean or, or, or within the United States is um, uh, either territorial seas 12 miles or exclusive economic zone, which is 200 miles, right? Um, and that's pertinent because uh, the law of the sea convention uh, uh, defines regulations in different ways based on whether you're within uh, that exclusive economic zone off a coast or beyond it, right? Um, in a lot of cases, if, if you had uh, if you were talking about doing uh, uh, field research within U.S. waters, for example, uh, the place to start would be a law called the Marine Protection Resources and Sanctuaries Act. Uh, and it yeah, it's our way of implementing the London Convention within our waters, okay? And uh, it's administered by EPA. Uh, there's people with, uh, uh, with a specialization on this uh, uh, topic. And one of the things that they've told me in recent discussions is they're actually excited about getting proposals in this context, right? Uh, and uh, the process would be uh, that you would have to obtain a permit uh, to engage in the research, right? And uh, there'd be areas that would be prescribed for, for where that could happen. And there'd obviously be guidelines uh, for it to, to happen. But uh, for most cases, if you were dealing with uh, uh, with uh, ocean-based uh, CDR within U.S. waters, at least that would be that would be the first place. Now they'd they'd also bring in uh, other agencies that 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 might uh, uh, be pertinent, and and depending on where you did it, that you might also have some state obligations, right? If it was very close to shore, uh, there's something called the Coastal Zoning Management Act. Uh, and 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 there'd be obligations that states could potentially impose. There might even be local obligations in some cases. If you were, for example, putting olivine on a beach, right, uh, to to try to in, in, uh, engage in enhanced mineral weathering, uh, the local uh, 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 officials would also have uh, uh, regulation over that. So, uh, uh, but but that's that's where I would start with most efforts to do experiments where you're going to put something in the water within U.S. waters. And every country is different uh, in this context, by the way. For example, in Germany, uh, Germany has uh, extremely narrowly circumscribed what you can do in coastal areas when it comes to carbon removal. They've, they've said that you can engage in experiments uh, involving uh, so-called nature-based solutions, right, but nothing else. Now, no one knows what that means right now, right? Is, is ocean iron fertilization a nature-based solution? Probably not. Uh, is, is kelp farming? Probably yes, uh, uh, but it's, it's not defined, right? But so one would have to look at, at every country's uh, regulations to determine what, what would be pertinent uh, within the, uh, exclusive economic zones. Right. Yeah. And just, I mean, thinking about kind of the different ocean CDR approaches, so you mentioned a couple just now, um, how would you rank them in terms of which ones face the biggest legal challenges and kind of what those challenges are? Yeah, well, you know, it's it's going to be hard to know, I think, until until we start seeing what what is 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 of most concern by regulatory folks, right, which sometimes is surprising, sometimes not. Um, if If I were thinking about it, I would think that um, uh, uh, things like ocean iron fertilization are probably likely to get the most scrutiny just because um, uh, I, I think some of the impacts could be extremely uh, serious um, and it involves you know, placement of, of materials that people wouldn't naturally think about placing into the into sensitive ocean ecosystems, right? Um, 
I, my guess is, is that things like, uh, like kelp farming, where there is more experience uh, uh, already with, you know, blue carbon solutions and things of that nature, uh, probably uh, easier from a, from a regulatory perspective. Um, some of these are going to be incredibly novel, uh, anything that involved like a, a, a electrochemical processes, right, uh, where it would also involve you know, transport of hydrochloric acid at some point, right? Uh, it's going to be an extremely novel sort of thing for for regulatory uh, 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 people to to look at. Yeah, makes sense. Um, yeah, I mean, another question we got was, you know, through your experience, startups you've worked with, and things like, what specific legal challenges are you seeing as kind of the most pressing issues that they actually face? Yeah, well, you know, we're in really early stages with uh, with most of these in terms of uh, engaging with the, the regulatory environment. But I'd say uh, one challenge for a lot of the companies I've seen, for example, I'm on the review committee for Stripe, right? So you, the, a lot of startups have sought to obtain uh, funding from uh, uh, Stripe, which is this uh, large credit uh, processing company in Canada. And uh, one of the one of the things I've seen with a lot of the startups is when when Stripe asks them the questions about you know have they engaged with governance have they thought about it um, uh, they've done none right and so uh, they're automatically almost uh, out of the running right and so uh, one of the things even though it is a challenge because it is obviously an expense uh, that I would encourage any startup is to uh, 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 engage engage legal counsel to try to help explore some of that or uh, contact uh, folks like Ocean Vision, for example, that are now working in this field uh, to try to get a sense of what the uh, regulatory uh, lay of the land is, right? Um, I, I think challenge uh, that they'll have moving forward once we we really start trying to get permits, again, is the novelty of these approaches, right? Um, if you look at the Marine Protection uh, Research and Sanctuaries Act that I talked about before, uh, a lot of what they've seen is people trying to dump waste, right? Or dredge materials, right, uh, in, into the oceans, um, you know, for the purposes of disposal, right? Uh, they haven't seen a lot of efforts to try uh, to uh, to utilize these things for other purposes, um, uh, they're not going to be that aware of of the the scientific literature in this context. Uh, it's going to require you know a lot of initial risk characterization and things like that. And so you know, quite frankly, I think some of the early uh, 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 early initiators um, are going to run through quite a gambit. Uh, the good news in some ways is that, as has been true with regulation in a lot of contexts, uh, the regulators will learn pretty quickly and they'll, uh, uh, they'll streamline this process and, and it'll, it'll become more expedited down the road. But, you know, I'd be lying if I said it's not likely that it's going to be, you know, a, a slower, more protracted process at the outset, given how novel uh, these things are, either here or in any other country that uh, that one might do it. And the same thing at the international level where they just haven't had much experience with these things, right? And yeah. you know, even at London, right? They've seen ocean air fertilization, but uh, you know, uh, ocean alkalization enhancement or upwelling or downwelling or or kelp farming, not really on their radar screen. That, that's the good news about this correspondence group because they really are, bringing in experts, including Gazamp, for example, who did you know, a very large study on ocean CDR recently uh, to help them learn about these things. Uh, and again, I think that's an attestation of the fact that they're not hostile to carbon removal per se, but they're, they're trying to learn about it. And uh, the more the community can provide them with that kind of input uh, uh, in that process, the better. Right. Okay. And where do you see this all kind of going, right? Because we have a bunch of countries and states that have signed on to these things, but not all of them. They're not legally binding. Um, do you think everyone's eventually going to converge on a solution or is someone, you know, someone going to go rogue and start doing this and then the floodgates open? Like what's your yeah. prediction where this goes? Yeah. Well, you know, we had somebody go rogue on ocean iron fertilization a few years ago, right? And, uh, you know, in some ways, I don't think I think that was a that was really regrettable because what it did was it probably 
made some of these regimes uh, uh, overreact in terms of, of you know, how they responded to carbon removal, right? Because the, the fear was, well, everybody's just going to go out there and, and do this without any kind of regulatory purview, and that's going to be bad, right? Which I think everybody, uh, the kind of people that are, 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 you know, engaged with you, I think would agree, right? It, it needs to be done in a responsible fashion, even if it needs to be pretty expeditious at this point, right? And so uh, it's, it's, it's my hope that nobody will go go rogue, right? Um, I, I suspect uh, that, uh, uh, that London will start uh, developing guidelines pretty quickly uh, for some of these other approaches. And quite frankly, what they're asking for, which is essentially risk assessment, is what these uh, startups are going to have to engage in no matter what jurisdiction they're in, right? If you're, if you're in US waters, you're gonna to have to do an environmental impact assessment at some point, which is gonna look a lot like this risk assessment framework, right? And so uh, it's, it's, it, I don't think it's gonna be any more pernicious uh, and it'll quite frankly set you up to, to be able to operate in other areas. And so, uh, you know, the, the thing I tell people about regulation sometimes is regulation can limit what you can do, but it can also be facilitative, right? It can, uh, it can provide you with the guidelines that allow you to proceed uh, with the protection of the law. Uh, and it can also facilitate uh, investors having confidence that you're both responsible and uh, you've been uh, sanctioned by, by legal bodies to proceed. And that can be helpful from a standpoint of raising funds. So don't, don't always view regulation as, as hostile. Uh, it, it, it can also be helpful. And, and in a nascent field like this, uh, it really can be. Yeah, it's a great lead into my, the last question before I hand back to Jamie to close us out. Um, if you were kind of designing this from the ground up, what kind of key policy elements would you want to put in place to make Ocean CDR really work? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think I think we've got some of some of what we need, right? Uh, uh, I I think what we, one of the things that we're missing, and people don't always think of this as as governance, but I consider it governance is uh, is public engagement. Uh, I really do think we need to uh, start educating the public more about these approaches. Uh, including some of the trade-offs, right? There, there will be risks with some of these approaches. There's no free lunch at this point, right? Given this massive science experiment we've engaged in, in terms of climate change. Uh, and I think we, we need to engage with the public to tell them that. Uh, we need to try uh, to ensure that stakeholders have uh, input as we start developing environmental impact assessments and and start deploying these approaches, and that's something I don't think that we've we've done a lot about. And I know again, sometimes startups uh, would shriek when they hear you know uh, talking about public engagement, uh, but again, it's at their peril, right? Because if we don't educate the public about why we need to look at these approaches, why we may need to deploy these approaches and engage stakeholders in, in, a, in a way that ensures that they don't feel threatened, there'll be backlash down the road when you try to um, uh, do this, right? And, and that won't be in anybody's interest. It'll harbor mistrust. It'll slow things down even more. It may create all kinds of, of, of backlash that, that imperils this. And so, um, that's that's something that I would establish foundationally that I don't think we're uh, we're looking at uh, very much. Uh, the NAS has talked about it in its latest carbon removal report, but in a really kind of broad, gauzy sort of way, right? Uh, uh, we we need to start looking at what stakeholder engagement looks like and start engaging in some of that now, especially in terms of some of these coastal approaches, but also some of the land-based approaches. Uh, that may have some real land use implications, right? Enhanced mineral weathering or large scale backs. Uh, and we're not doing that at this point. Great, thank you so much. That, um, it's been a great presentation and thanks so much for answering all these questions, Dr. Burns. Um, Jamie, I'm just gonna hand it back to you to quickly give a quick overview of next week's presenters and things like that. Um, but Dr. Burns, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you.